a lot of concerns right now about where we're going in the market. Some mm. people say, rather sit mm. on your hands, don't do anything for the time being. Yeah. What would your strategy be at this stage? And also just uh, taking a look back, stepping back and saying, well, what has happened every time that we've seen uh, markets coming under pressure? I mean, what is, a, what is a market at the end of the day? It's, a, it's, a, it's really a conglomeration of a whole bunch of people that try and price a whole bunch of assets based upon what they think they know about those assets and about their forecast or their future aspirations for a stock or for an asset class. That's really what a market is. And on a daily basis, people look at information, they discern information, they put it all together and they decide if it's buy or a sell. And that moves prices up or it moves prices down. Now imagine you had somebody in the market that said, look, I tell you what, you don't have to worry, earnings are going to be going up. So you don't have to worry about it, you know. This is about how much earnings are going to be going up in general and maybe for specific counters. We wouldn't have a market anymore. We wouldn't be buyers and sellers anymore. They'd either be just buyers and if there was that kind of certainty about earnings coming down, you'd literally just have sellers. But that will also make a completely efficient market, which means at the end of the day, your market will just price in all the news that there is right as it happens on a continuous basis, which invariably doesn't happen. And that's why you stand here every morning and say to people, it's up half a percent, it's down 2%, and then it was up 3%, and then it's down 2%. And this is how the thing seesaws on a continuous basis. Of course, it's all noise, but we have to strip out the noise and actually look at longer term trends. Absolutely. And that's why longer term trends become so important and only the only thing that the, in order to understand longer term trends one has to look at history and that is why I always find that history is the best the best teacher as far as markets are concerned it comes with a caveat though and that is that invariably what happens is if you've got a structural change in markets or structural change in your political um, in your political arena as far in, and that and that's going to affect a specific market or a specific region you have to obviously take those things into consideration because that can affect your historical numbers you mentioned uh, looking back in history. Let's take a step back. In May 1932, yeah. uh, the 12-month return, the low points are down 31% for the markets. The first six months after that low point, a gain of 5%. The next six months, a gain of 54%. And then if you have, if you did miss the first six months, the returns for the next 24 months, a gain of 50%. Yeah, and that's invariably the trend. I mean, the work that that, that I've done over here, okay, looks at the the worst bear markets in the last in the last hundred years. Of the markets and that and it really looks at 11 periods where you've had these fantastic you know fantastic meltdowns in markets and in essence what 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 we how we define a meltdown is on a rolling 12 month basis what the low point is for that rolling 12 month period and then we look at if you were then invested for for 6 months beyond that, you know, for the first six months, and then having missed the first six months, what happens for the next six months? And that's generally the trend that you're talking about over there. Mm -hmm. You, in the first six months, it's pretty much a mixed bag. I mean, eight out of the 11, uh, eight of the 11 times, you know, you would have, would have had a positive return, but those positive returns, uh, you know, could, any be, could be anywhere in the order of about 1%, you know, all the way up to fantastic returns like May 1982 at 65%. Mm -hmm. If you had missed the first six months and you'd only decided to get involved in the market for the next six months or, or in get involved in the market six months later, you know, you would have had a positive return about seven out of the ten times. And the reason why this is now ten times is because one of the main meltdowns is February 2009 or the running 12-month period. Exactly, uh, the market's down 38%. And yeah. The six months after the low points, we up 37 yeah, percent. So we've correct. basically broken even. Correct. And um, you know, we've, we've, we're basically five months in. So at the end of the February, we'll have the six-month number. Mm -hmm. And you know, for all intended purposes, that's going to be up even more. You know, but the important thing here is that even if you've missed these six-month periods, okay, but you invest for two years beyond a crash, invariably what happens is you just make money. 100 percent of the time, markets are up from where they were before. And that is because earnings start coming back into the cycle. Mm -hmm. Because you see companies start normalizing, it becomes normal, people start thinking normally about markets, the pain gets left behind, and you get invariably you've got economic expansion and the likes and so forth. And that's what you're starting to see now. You're starting to see signs of this coming through. You know, you saw the the, the, uh, the British economy uh, yesterday, you know, emerging from you know from a recession. Only just. Only just. 0.1% for the fourth Only quarter. just. But it's, it's, it's a start. You know, and if, if their recovery takes a another two or three years mm. beyond this, that's also okay. But it's not bad news anymore. You know, it's, that's not news that can drive a market down into, you know, into, into slum territory, you know. It could be, some would argue that we're living in very different times uh, at this stage. Uh, we've also got to keep in mind political risks coming to the fore, emerging from China, in Japan, in the US, all this talk about bank regulation. So, so it's a very different scenario that is playing out here. Remember that that is a sector-specific issue. 
Remember, if we talk about banks, we're talking about a sector on a, in a market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't affect necessarily what happens in other markets, chemical market, the coal market, the industrial market. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect those markets. It might affect them um, you know, from a lending perspective, but you need to factor those things, you know, things into the equation. We've gone, through you know, we've gone through crashes before which have affected industries quite, uh, quite tremendously uh, you know, from, you know, from, you know, from time to time. And this is just par for the course, it's normal. It's not like this is abnormal. So you're buying at this stage, Kobe? Well, absolutely. If there's, if it's buy, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's good buying opportunity, if it's good buying opportunity, you should be looking at buying. And invariably, what happens at the moment is people are still coming in with some bad numbers, you know, for the last six months. Um, and when the when earnings surprise on the downside, the stock sells down by 10 or 11 percent. If that's something that you want to own, you should be looking at buying these companies. Um, you know. What one should be asking yourselves, you know, if you look right across all the different asset classes, you know, what is fairly priced? What, it, what asset class are you prepared to put your money into? And you mustn't put money into markets for six months. You must try and put money into markets for longer periods of time. You know? Do you think you should be stock picking right now or investing into indices? Well, that, that's, an, that's, that's a philosophical question, mm. you know, at the end of the day. You know, there's no right or wrong answer depending on the cycle. It's dependent on the type of investor that you are and depending on what is important to you. If you believe that you, you know, that you understand companies better and you, you believe you understand the fundamentals that drive specific counters, you should certainly be stock selected. And you should certainly be, uh, you should be adding value and you should be able to add value by doing stock selection. But if you're not interested in that and in, in by virtue of you're a private investor, you want to buy a fund and you don't believe, in, you know, investment managers can add value long term by doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. You should just go and buy the ETF or just go and look at buying a tracker fund. But it is a it's a very big philosophical question and I think it's a question that many investors in the institutional space has been asking for quite a bit of time and people in the, in the, in the private space are starting to ask.